Once again, I'd like to welcome you to the True Grace Gospel Program. My name is Bobby Carmen. I appreciate this opportunity to come to your home by the way of the radio or in your automobile if you're driving down the road or whatever it may be. You could be watching us on the YouTube or the Facebook. Uh, but we welcome you to the True Grace Gospel Program. And if you've watched any of our messages at all, you would know that we are about establishing the Apostle Paul's grace gospel that was given to him by the ascended Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. And what we're trying to get you to do is follow through uh, what the Bible has been teaching the whole time. In the Old Testament, it's Jews first and Gentiles later. And we have several men that testify of the works of the Gentiles and things that are going to come. Isaiah is a good book on that. He probably mentions the Gentiles 25 times in his book uh, about them coming, but they're not there yet. And even when Moses comes, Moses uh, doesn't give any recognition or acceptation he doesn't welcome them. He doesn't seek to convert them or to evangelize the Gentiles. Moses is strictly a Jew, and he is going uh, to establish the law because uh, God has chosen Moses to do this. It's his work to do, and God's going to help him. He's not going to forsake him, giving him something to do that would be so hard of establishing 613 commandments and seven feast days and holy days and uh, all of these things of what to do for his looking and appearance, as for his wearing clothes, of things to eat, places to live. Well, God is going to help Moses step by step through this. And Moses' law is going to be in existence for 1,570 years before Christ is born. Amen. And there's a lot of Old Testament back here that uh, people don't understand this, but it was given entirely, wholly, exclusively to the Jewish people who will make up the house of Israel. Amen. The house of Israel comes through... Uh, Jacob's seed. He has 12 sons, and those 12 sons, uh, they make up what we know and what they knew as the house of Israel. And there were not any Gentile nations in this. They were no Gentile people as far as even kings or not uh, anyone that are included and that this law of Moses is going to take dominance over. So we want you to understand the contents of the book. Uh, we always get blamed for a lot of things that people think and their opinion that is formed about us, uh, but it's just a conclusion of an opinion that they have uh, thought about and expressed it. I'm not telling nobody not to read the Old Testament. No, I'm not. I'm telling you that if you are a saved person, to read first Paul's 14 books. Amen. And this is going to define whether you are really saved or not. Most of you, probably 90% of you, are Gentile people. And the only way you can be saved is not by Moses' law. It's not by his works and his deeds and his commandments and ordinances and doctrines and holy days and feast days. It's not that a Gentile like yourself is going to join a denominational church out here and be saved. And then you adopt or you take uh, part in what the Bible says as far as what was uh, laid upon Israel to do. It's not for you, friend. It's not for you, neighbor. It's not for you, churchgoer. It's not for anyone except the house of Israel. Amen. That's what the whole content of the law was meant to do, was to um, make Israel aware of and make them understand what God's will and purpose 
for Israel, the chosen people of God, through the seed of Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, and through the twelve sons. Amen. That's Israel. Like when Peter preached in Acts 2.38, he was preaching to the house of Israel. Amen. He was not preaching to Jewish, I mean to uh, Gentile people. He was preaching to the Jewish people. That's who makes up the house of Israel. The twelve apostles were uh, Jews. The content of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and about Jesus and the twelve apostles, and about the things going on in their dispensation of time. Listen, that was all Jewish doctrine. Why do I know that? Because Paul has a revelation. And that revelation tells us in Galatians 4, uh, about verses 1 through 4, that Christ was born of a woman made under the law to redeem them, who them? Israel, out from under the law. He was a Jew. That's the only way he could fulfill the law is to become born under the law through a woman and that he had to establish the, the redemption through the works and the deeds and the participation of the law himself. He couldn't just come and not do anything of a great magnitude or not participate in any works of the law and try to say that he come to deliver Israel from the law. Amen. He had to do these things as far as works, as far as deeds, as far as things that uh, were necessary to complete, to finish, to fulfill, and then abolish. Hallelujah. This is what Christ came in the world to do. I'm not trying to erase anything out. I'm not trying to erase not one prophet out of the 39 books of the Old Testament. I'm not trying to uh, negate all the things that they accomplished and achieved and fulfilled. No. Rather, I'm trying to show you where Christ worked in the realm of those laws and ordinances through what the prophets spoke and what the prophets uh, gave as far as their dispensation and the time period that they lived in, that God used them to say certain things. And these things were called prophecy. And uh, us Gentile people today, as far as being born in the flesh, still Gentile people, we're not Jews uh, by nature. We're not born uh, as a natural Jew. Probably 90, 95% of us are all Gentiles. But the Gentiles were in the future of God's plan of salvation. Amen. And I said salvation. I didn't say a part of 4,200 religions. I didn't say that the Gentiles could be saved by 4,200 religions just simply by joining a church of their choice and trying to work the things that they require and want you to do as far as being a member of that church organization. You belong to a religion. Salvation does not come through a religion. Amen. It comes through understanding the grace gospel that the Apostle Paul was given the word revelation to. Praise the Lord. Okay. Revelation means also like a secret. It's secret things that God had concealed throughout time, throughout all of the 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. Secrets and revelations were hidden. Mysteries were hidden. And they, no one understood them. It was God's choosing to start revealing them to the Apostle Paul when he's called in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. God immediately begins to deal with Paul's mind and Paul's spirit. 
He is going to put things in Paul's understanding that no prophet before him, not Moses, not Isaiah, not Jeremiah, not Ezekiel, not Noah, not a Adam himself, has no inclination whatsoever of the revelations that have been kept secret and they are revealed to Paul and Paul alone. Amen. Not even one of Paul's associates, not even Luke, uh, no, no other convert of Paul's under his ministry has these revelations. Not Apollos, no, not even Timothy or Titus, no. Paul is the first, the only man that has these revelations. Amen. They have been kept secret by God and through Jesus the Christ, he never revealed any type of knowledge and wisdom of these secrets and times that is going to be given to Paul. And it's going to be given through the form of a forgiveness that we call grace and a mercy and a compassion that we call grace. And because Paul is the first person that's ever going to be revealed to in his time, this grace, this dispensation of the pouring out of the grace of God, total, complete forgiveness. There is no way that any uh, person of the Jew Jews society, from a priest to a prophet to a king, even like Saul and David and Solomon, there was nothing revealed to those three kings of Jewish history that even look forward to and point that God eventually is going to save people by a total forgiveness of the works and the deeds of the law, a total forgiveness for the shortcomings and the failures that we have committed, and then on top of that, joining us heathen dog Gentiles without any commitment, without any works and deeds of the law, God just immediately sends Paul to us Gentiles to reap the harvest of those of us that would believe on Jesus as the Christ. Amen. Paul is given that ministry to give us understanding, to give us wisdom, to give us knowledge of what God intends and purposed for us to do. It's a hard thing for those Jews back in that dispensation of time to look at us Gentiles then and for years and years to come. The way the Jews look at us now are that we're still heathen. We're still dogs in their eyes. They want to uh, make a boast and brag about their situation where they are Jews and Jewish born and that they are in favor with God. Amen. Well, see, Paul, he tells the history here of what this is going to do. This history that God is going to give Paul makes him aware of that he is now turning to the Gentiles to take a people out of us uh, for even just simply believing Praise on the Lord. Christ. No works. Not through Jewish bloodline. Not to keep uh, the genealogy of the Jews going. Christ is going to turn to Paul in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. From that moment on, Christ is going to be giving Paul secrets and mysteries that's been hid from the foundation of the world. And now, if you read Paul's letters, you will find that God has blinded the minds of the Jews and that they can't seek and understand what this gospel 
the gospel of grace to us Gentiles without works and deeds of the law, without being of genealogy of one of those twelve sons. They do not understand it. Why? Because God has their minds blinded. Amen. Read it for yourself in the book of Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Read it for yourself in the book of Romans. It's in almost all of Paul's teachings of his 14 books, the difference between Jews and Gentiles. Did you know that 17 times in Paul's 14 books, he mentions the words of being secret and the words of being hidden mysteries. Hidden mysteries. Secrets of God that have been kept secret. How long did Paul say? Do any of you know? He said all the way back from the beginning of time before the age was. Amen. Does that make any impression on you at all that God has kept secrets from Adam's offspring? He's kept secrets from them on purpose? It was none of their business. That's exactly what the Lord is showing. It's not who they choose to be saved. It's not whom they are going about to please uh, to make a show in the flesh of. No, no. We've got all of this wrong. Religion has things stacked against most people. Amen. Religion has piles and piles of do's and don'ts and what uh, God likes and what God don't like. And they try to dig out of those uh, what they think that the Lord requires. I'm going to tell you what the Lord requires. Nothing. You cannot save yourself by doing any work of the law. Amen. You cannot save yourself and find favor with God in any book of this Bible of whoever declared what's written in them. What Christ come to do was to finish and to fulfill and to complete Moses' law of all the things written by all of the prophets of the 39 books of the Old Testament. He came to complete them, to finish them, to fulfill. That means to participate in them. That means to expose himself to them and bring himself under subjection to them. And Jesus Christ did it. He participated in all of it and he completed it perfectly. He never broke one law or one commandment. Thank you, Jesus. He never done anything wrong on any Sabbath day. He never had a fault or a failure that was a true, uh, a true, I guess you would call it, uh, thing with God as far as finding fault of being guilty. He didn't have any guiltiness because of his breaking the law. His guiltiness was because of jealousy through the priesthood and through the house of Israel. Amen. They could not do or perform the miracles that Christ did. And believe me, uh, Christ did ten thousands of miracles uh, in their eyesight, right in view of them. And they could only be astonished and look at one another and shake their head. Because they could not perform such works and deeds. But Christ did it all. Amen. And they couldn't stand it. They were so jealous of Jesus. Only thing they could hope to do is turn enough people, even among the Gentiles, against Jesus the Christ and try to get him killed try to get him put out of their misery because he was turning their world whom they had been in control upside, upside down. down. 
Now I'm telling you, that's what Christ come to do. Mm -hmm. He come to complete it and finish it, and he did. And no devil took his life before that happened. Amen. No devil stopped him from doing anything that he desired to do and had to do as far as completing the law. Thank you, Jesus. Christ had a mission. Mm -hmm. That mission, he completed it and fulfilled it, and then the devil laid hands on him. And then the devil went forth to proceed to kill the Son of God. It was the devil's goal and mission to kill the Son of God so that he could have control, so that he would have authority and power. And because the devil himself had turned against his creator, which was Jesus, and the devil had turned all of the angels, a third of the host of heaven, the scripture says, against their creator also. And when they did this, God kicked them out of heaven onto earth. Amen. And that's what Revelation plainly tells you. That's what other places in the scripture t talks about as far as the angels that were uh, disobedient and they were kicked out of heaven, a third of the host of the angels that the tail of the serpent, who was the devil, brought with him out of heaven onto earth. And from that moment on, the earth was occupied by angels that were disobedient and failed to do what God intended and purposed for them to do. Amen. <clears throat> what we have here is a lot of blank spaces in all of these religions, a lot of blank spaces, a lot of places that no one can comment on because they do not know how to fill them in. They haven't read, secured, and understood what the book of the Bible has been teaching all of these years, but they never found those little nuggets. They never found them little pearls of great price that God has put these prophets and put it in their writings and it went on and they are just overlooked. They're not taken seriously because their spirit has not been given through the Holy Ghost by Christ. No. What they've been given was teaching at seminaries and teaching at churches and teaching in things of the ministry that they so uphold so uh, to be so great. But nevertheless, they never got it genuinely from God. Amen. Through the Spirit, through the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost did not teach them. And most preachers, most people that desire to be in the work of what they call that ministry, uh, God did not call them. Amen. They just went forth on their own. Some of them saw it as a way to be have a prosperous life. They saw it as a way to be in control of people as far as a, a church full of people of the neighborhood. They saw it as a way that they wouldn't have to get out and work hard, work by the sweat of their brow, and work by the uh, sweat of what their hands was doing in an occupation. No, they found it easy to manipulate people and take this authority personality, keeping people in bondage. They took this authority and they even abused their power and they threaten their parishioners and tell them that they have to do this and they have to do that. They're not going over in Paul's gospel to learn such things that they need to know about God's grace, about m God's mercy, about God's forgiveness. No, they rather go over here in a places like Malachi and tell you for sure that if you pay 
tithes, you'll be okay and you'll be blessed. But if you don't pay tithes, you have robbed God. Amen. Those are all false accusations. Amen. God never meant for money to be as such of a powerful influence and in the situation of the giving in such a place that it is so powerful that it brings condemnation if a person does not pay tithes or does not give what is recommended in their situation. No, neighbor, I'm telling you, a lot of people that the churches have hired in their positions in that body that they call a church in that assembly that has a name of a denomination uh, God never meant for it to be or to come down in the situation that we are in today it's like God's people are fighting amongst themselves it's like God's chosen people his creation cannot get along together they have discrepancies they have divisions they have things that separate and god did not put any of them there to cause any of that amen what god tried to do through the sending of his son in the form of a fleshly man uh, to die on the cross of Calvary and fulfill all the works and the deeds of the law. But now all of the divisions within the realms of church society, within the realms of church religions, of certain denominations, they all have a division. They're not alike. They don't have the same mother and they don't have the same father. Amen. Because if they did, they would all have the same DNA. Amen. Spiritually, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about carnal. I'm talking about spiritually. Jesus told the Jews that God was not their father. What was he saying to them? They've said and answered right back. He said, we have Abraham to be our father. Yeah. They talked back to him in the realm that they, through genealogy, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and one of the 12 sons of Jacob, they had the DNA genealogy of what they did have this connection to all the way back to Abraham, one of the fathers. Yeah, but what uh, they do not have and what they missed out on was that connection spiritually. The spiritual DNA is more, uh, it's more desirable, it's more powerful, and it's what as God has insisted and persisted that you must do. Talk to God. Tell Him your position. Talk to God. Ask Him what to do in your situations. And see what the Lord tells you. Don't go talking to men. They will tell you of some performance in their life that they think will help you in your life. Amen. And it ain't going to work. Amen. They're completely different. What you have to do is follow after the spiritual things that this book requires of you. You have to follow after what the Holy Ghost wants you to do. You, as a person, God, I'm sure, has put upon you and desired of you that you do something in the form of working in a ministry. But everybody has to be a preacher. They feel like there ain't no other jobs in the ministry. They feel like they ain't got nothing to do. Even all the women, they don't have no jobs out here in the ministry. They all want to be preachers too. Something of which Apostle Paul gives his opinion, and he gives what he has been taught himself as for as a woman uh, in the church. 
Read, read it for yourself. I'm not going to make you mad. I'm not going to give you some uh, something that you can take and use against me by halfway quoting and halfway putting in it your perspective of what you think. But just read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 31, 32, 33, and 34. 14. 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1, 31, 32, 33, and 34. Now, if you care about the truth, you'll read it. But I'm not going to give you information to go out here and shoot me down and say I am a woman hater. And that's the reputation Paul had, that he was a woman hater. No, he was acting upon his leading through the Holy Ghost that Christ gave him. Amen. And I want you to understand those things. So, some of you think I'm so hard, but yet I have never touched on so many things in the books of First and Second Corinthians that Paul was giving, just like the law was given in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and uh, Deuteronomy, just like all the law that was given to Moses by Christ, no doubt, by Jesus, well, uh, these books that Paul writes in the 14 books of his lifetime and his ministry, they are what we would call our guidelines as Gentiles uh, by the church. And it touches on many, 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 many things. It touches on husbands and wives and their work and the children. It touches on things in uh, detail about marriage it t touches about things about widows. It touches about things of the Lord's Supper. It touches about things of baptisms. It touches about things of paying these tithes. And Paul didn't say tithes. He said, let every one of you get, give accordingly upon the first day of the week. God has prospered you. And he said in a couple of his writings that wherever you go, he said, you remember to give unto the poor. He's talking about the poor saints that came out of Jerusalem when that they expected that Christ was coming back there in uh, like the book of Acts. And they he did not come back, but they ended up and sold, waiting on the Lord, their possessions, their lands, their farms, their animals. Everything that they had, they sold it and brought it and laid it at the feet of the twelve apostles in Judaism and what the Jews' religion required. And they gave it to the twelve to distribute to the needy and the poor among those. But finally, they went bankrupt. They gave more people was using out of it than they, they were given back to it. And they eventually become the poor of Jerusalem. Very poor. Hungry poor. Destitute of things that they need. Poor. And Paul picks this work of that up in his ministry. And he tells us Gentiles to remember the poor. That thing he was very urgent about wanting us to remember the poor saints at Jerusalem. And Paul, after he had talked to Peter, assured him that that's what he had been about. Paul is laying out these guidelines which eventually will become to us like a law. But it's not like a law that if we can't perform that we're breaking law. It just means that we are unable to fulfill uh, what Paul is teaching us to learn to do. But Paul touches many, many things. He touches baptisms, communions, or last suppers. He touches the things uh, in the ministry that he is establishing by grace. By grace he has preached and is preaching to the Gentile people. Amen. And he's telling us that though